Hello, I'm Tim Masso. Welcome to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight. I shall be your host for the evening. This evening, the best watches to buy at various price points from $3,000 to $300,000. Random viewer questions answered all of that and I feature your viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Spare a thought for the people who put all of the pixels on the page, the watchbox.com, the folks who have 3,000 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now for many brands in every styles and just like tonight's show for every budget. Let's see who's joining in. Edward Ledden of Sweden, Marcus T of Germany, Marco B, Dylan L. Dylan, you're in the show. Thomas B, Butik One of Poland, Alex O, Jim Millett, Scott Wexland from Westchester, Pennsylvania, Robert G, Joe Pinto from Louisville, but from New Jersey tonight instead of Louisville, he travels. Jason P, Tim Wright, Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina, and we've got Insane Connected joining in for the first time live. And Adriano 17 and the 95th Phantom, Eddie Myers, welcome guys. Okay, so I was researching how to store a car for the winter, because if you can store a car, it's not gonna run for eh, about three months. You really should look up best practices. And this is what happens when you take a car out of storage. Good gouge, as we would say in the Navy, check for nesting creatures. If that sounds a little bit nuts to you, you're right, it's exactly that, straight up nuts. And we have a red squirrel to thank for it, uh, as this guy apparently found 42 gallons and well over 100 pounds of raw walnuts inside of his Chevrolet Avalanche put there by, you guessed it, the squirrel. He's even got them in his frame rails and he doesn't know how to get them out because he doesn't have squirrel-sized hands. Uh, still, I'd gladly take this over Tesla's problem with critters at its new German factory. That's just gross and quite possibly rabid. And the inverse is true too. While naturally occurring creatures are known to infest engineered transportation, we have evidence of highly engineered creatures infesting natural transportation. We love our pugs. Okay, welcome guys. Dan CT joining in Time Hill. We've got Union Park. We've got a Mick in Florida, Victor and Alexi Samola of Finland all joining in along with Philly Watch fan, Mez9, Adam Crossfire. Guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. We've got Mark S from Brooklyn and Marco B. Neo, welcome to the show. All right, so tonight I'm gonna answer some of the random questions that people have sent me. Some of them are watch related, some of them are decidedly not. But I'm also gonna talk about the best watches between 3,000 and three hundred thousand dollars and before I do that I'm checking out viewer wrist shots number one starting with Mike T who impresses with his rose gold Richard Meal RM10 showing some class right there Jesse S powers along in his Audi R8 with his IWC big pilot Torno limited edition of 50 pieces in rose gold Walter H spoils us with this gorgeous shot of his FP Journ Chronomet Bleu in Napa California with wine attendant Awesome shot. That's the pure photography win of the night. We have Edward K of Singapore joining the action with his Urwerk UR-111C Black. Nicely shot. Uh, the gardens, I believe, down by the Marina Bay Sands, if I recognize that correctly. And then we have Anton D taking us for a drive in San Fran with his 1985 Porsche 911, replete with Momo accessory steering wheel and his Vacheron Constantin American 1921. Very well done, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see who's in the box right now. Adriano17, will the No Time to Die Omega go up or down in price now that the film is out? Other than the Silver Snoopies, to be perfectly frank, I get the feeling that no Omega Limited Editions are going to gain a lot of value. The James Bond watches tend to be built in huge volumes. When you're talking 10,007 or 11,007 or 7,007 pieces, of course, for Agent 007. In general, you're just talking about a watch that's gonna be fun and themed. Buy it because you like it, not because you think it's gonna go up in value. Again, if you wanna spend way too much money on a limited edition Omega, the Silver Snoopy is still the way to go. Okay, speaking of ways to spend reasonable amounts of money, by the way, I will talk about James Bond in this episode, but there's a cottage industry of watch YouTubers just wailing on James Bond and riffing on that endlessly, so I'm not gonna go too deep into the watch side of it. But if you wanna spend some money on a dive watch that's better than what Omega currently offers in the Diver 300 meter collection right now, I would say that the Oris Aquastate Caliber 400 is the best $3,000 price class watch of 2021, and it's not even close. No one else is offering this kind of value. First, it's an objectively desirable watch. Get it in 39.5 millimeters, as I prefer, or get it in 43.5 millimeters, 
millimeters if you've got the bigger wrist. They have it effectively in both Submariner and Sea Dweller sizes. It's a reasonably thin watch too. At 13.4, it undercuts literally every Omega Seamaster. And forget the 2021 Sub. They'll give you, well, what, three days of power reserve and five years of warranty? Step up to Oris with five days of power reserve and 10 years of warranty. And that's not just talking. The watch has a 10 year service interval. And that is the way it should be, not just from companies selling $3,500 watches like this, but from every company in the luxury watch space. This needs to be the new normal. Okay, caliber 400. It's a good looking movement. Two barrels, automatic winding. You've got the five days of power reserve. Surprisingly, it's a five position adjustment and Oris is giving a accuracy claim. So they're offering an accuracy claim of no worse than minus three plus five seconds per 24 hours, which is profoundly impressive as it would at face value exceed the COSC chronometer standards. There's a lovely little rack and pinion micrometric regulator on the balance and then Etacron, meaning it probably can be adjusted quite precisely. It's a tough movement. It's a broad movement. It fills out a case back nicely and it's not too thin. It's a wonderfully tough little thing that keeps good time and apparently doesn't really need too much maintenance. You could own this for almost a generation, pass it down to your kid and let him worry about paying for the first service. This is a game changer for the industry, even if it's not the watch you want, even if you're not in the dive watch market. I think we're going to look back on this timepiece as a turning point. And at $3,300 on a strap or $3,500 on a bracelet with quick release lugs, this is a very well thought out diver and a true luxury piece from Oris. Honorable mention, a long running watch that's been on the market now for about four years, the Tudor Pelagos left hand drive, $4,450, 42 millimeters titanium. I don't like Fotina in general, unless it's this, because sometimes a warm complementary color can add an emotional appeal that the standard watch does not have. The standard Pelagos, which is opposite hand drive and blue dial or black dial is attractive enough and it's a great piece. It's a wonderful watch to own. But for me, this slightly off-white e-crew loom does something, I don't know, it just tugs at my heartstrings. The red Pelago script, the matte black bezel and dial, there's something about this watch that manages to be I don't know, emotionally resonant, right down to the red date. This is a very special watch, and while it will cost you more than the Oris, and it only has Tudor's new five-year warranty, it's a wonderful piece with by far the best clasp of any dive watch currently going. This clasp has an elastic extension, a fold-out extension, and a multi-setting detent extension, all built in. Very impressive stuff. The Deep Sea does no better. I gotta shout out that class because you get it in every version of the Pelagos, not just the left-hand drive. That's gonna be my honorable mention for the relatively entry-level diver. Can you pay less for a dive watch? Yes. And Certina, Longines, Mido, Baum and Mercier, many will give you the opportunity, but I think $3,500 to $4,500 is where you start to get into really distinctive watches with a lot of features and functions to set them apart from the scrum. Now, viewer crest question, Rolex or Omega? Guys, is this a question or a show theme? That's, that's a lot to unpack, but I started in luxury watches with Omega, and while I respect Rolex, I don't particularly pine for Rolex. I still have two Omega watches in my collection. Grandpa's graduation watch, which was a quaintly named Seamaster DeVille, and then I have my Diver 300 meter from 2002. Those watches are fantastic and they're forever watches in my collection, but they're not the reason I choose Omega over Rolex. I choose Omega because it has a range that Rolex does not have. That is the caliber 2640, three day power reserve, master chronometer certified, a magnetic, central tourbillon, hand finished, hand assembled, hand regulated, and made of solid gold. There is no Rolex equivalent to this. Omega will periodically case up vintage movements, finish them, and sell them high horology, as they did about three, four years ago with the first chronograph. Omega will try things Rolex would never imagine in the modern era. Omega did the coaxial escape in 1999. Three years prior to that, they did the jump hour with the DeVille Prestige. 
There aren't going to be any Rolex jump hours. Omega also goes out on a limb. Sapphire case components, not just the display back, but the sides, as they did with the Hour Vision in 2007, uh, doing things with luxury quartz that Rolex no longer will. There was a time when Rolex would, ex would experiment with luxury quartz, but there is no Rolex equivalent to something like an X33, Z33, or Skywalker. All of this, including split-second chronograph watches, annual calendars, watches that can be used for everything from diving to skydiving to driving. Omega has a range from high horology to the entry level for him and for her across many different model ranges. You want to go knuckle for knuckle with a deep sea, you've got the Ploprof. You want something that's elegant like a Datejust, you have many options from the DeVille Prestige to the Hour Vision to the Constellation to the Globemaster. Again, Omega just feels like three or four different brands crammed together under one roof. You get all of that and you get the five-year warranty. And that's why Omega is my preference over Rolex. Okay, in the box, Jim Little saying, I still prefer the Seamaster 300 meter. Its thickness is 13.5 to Oris is 13.4. With the 15,000 Gauss protections, zero to five seconds per day allowed, master chronometer and coaxial Omega. I will say the Omega is a little bit fatter than that. They measure 13.7, 13.8 to my caliper. So I always measure the watches that I show in my reviews. And my experience has been with the exception of the Bulgari Octo Finissimo, almost every brand claims a thinner watch than they actually deliver. And yes, even within one model line like the Daytona, there is some variation between platinum and gold and steel cases. They are different thicknesses. All right, what else is going on in the box? We have Christopher H. saying, I respect Oris for their innovative value, technical excellence, and their customer service. I really wish I liked their designs, though. That's important. This is an emotional hobby. We have Benjamin B. Has Rolex ever made a tourbillon? No, not, not that I'm aware. Could a tourbillon have been built on a Rolex base by an independent, like a one-off by a master? Sure, it could have happened in the past. As far as I know, Oris, well, Oris, Rolex has discussed things like this in patents, but they've never actually built it. Thomas G, Omega all the way. And Thomas saying hello there, Tim. Hello, Thomas. Good to see you in the box. We have Kenneth Sham. Tim, how do you like to store your timepieces? Watch box, roll, etc. Watch box. Uh, I always feel like watches move around too much in a roll, and it's better to just give them their own individual slots where they're locked in place. Watch box. Put that in a safe for a safety deposit. Edward Ledden saying, X33 Gen 2 is one of my favorite quartz watches, and Sapphire is joining us from the great American state of Tennessee. And then we have Mark S. saying, my Blancpain is supposed to be 13.3 millimeters, but it's more like 14.1, and that is a fact. The Swiss will always overpromise and underdeliver, unless we're talking something like FP Jorn and Moser with power reserves, in which case they do give you a little bit more. All right. Now, jumping back to our regularly scheduled program and viewer wrist shots number two, I asked you answered your wrist on my list and we are starting with Neil W who has it all with the C5 Corvette, manual transmission, Oris Aquis relief, custom Stingray strap and F1 qualifying on television. That is a garage Mahal, my man. Akshal P hits the road with Mercedes-Benz and his watch box bought FP Jorn Santograph Sport in bright lacquered yellow. Looking good and thank you for trusting our company. Marvin R. and his Audemars Piguet Royal Oak report from sunny Nassau. And Saad A. sports his Moser Pioneer during a quiet moment at his home in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Looking good, kicking back, having fun. And Rick R. also looking good with his Zin 105 UTC joining us over lunch from Rome. How was the wine? Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Glenn T saying, my birth watch is a 68 Omega Dynamic. I love it. We've got Loy P. Tim, greetings from Dubai. Greetings. I will be in Dubai for Dubai Watch Week, so I hope to see you there. Dylan L saying, love that, Jorn. Davey 85, Planet Ocean 2500, Future Classic, Omega Diver. Only one original and still the best looking iteration of the line. Well, of course, the original Omega Diver 300 meter would have been, I think it was caliber 1109, and that became caliber 1120 with changes to the winding system, and that became 2500, and then in 2018, they changed that to the 8800. So there have been a couple of different versions. Strictly speaking, the original would have been the 1993, and I think that's caliber 1109. Okay, what else is going on right here? 
We have Tim Wright saying to Jim Millet, dude, that's awesome. Rolex Explorer 2 wears unite. I love that. We have a wonderful community in this show on this program. So Omega Aquaterra annual calendar. This is going to be your best like five to $10,000 watch because it can do everything. We talked about Omega's range. Now let's talk about the range of one Omega watch. Get it in 38.5 millimeters because for me that's the perfect size. Anyone can wear that and wear it well. Why pay up for a Blancpain 50 Fathoms annual calendar when you get the same thing for 8400 new from Omega and because this is Omega it's going to cost far less when it is used. There are some buys to be had for five grand or even a little bit below if you shop around. Now there are larger versions of this watch but why? 38.5 millimeters in steel. You've got it all. 150 meters water resistant, effectively amagnetic to 15,000 gauss or more. This is a watch that's a chronometer. This is a watch that's a coaxial escapement. It is an annual calendar with a double quick set. This is a watch with a versatile style. The Aquaterra, since it debuted back in 2002, has always been the surf or turf Seamaster. It's fine if you want to go out on the beach, if you want to take the plunge, if you want to fall off your yacht, but equally in the ballroom of the yacht club, unlike something along the lines of the Planet Ocean or a Ploprof, this is going to look right at home. It's well loomed, it's quite tough, internally it's just as robust as any other Seamaster because they use the same essential movement architecture. There is a lot to love. Launched in 2010, you will find there are many iterations, different sizes, straps, Whatever kind of strap you want, many different dials. If you want precious metal, they've got that too. A broad range of pricing, new or used, you will get it your way, and that's just the 38.5. So, honorable mention, because I think this deserves to be here, if we're talking about versatile sports dress watches, then this year's new Garrick S4 needs to be mentioned. Garrick out of Norfolk, UK, is only going to build about 50 to 100 watches a year, so we're talking a totally different level of scale than... Omega. Now 42 millimeters and 100 meters water resistant in steel means this is a bit big and burly for a dress watch. So it's got that extra gear if you do want to swim with it, throw it on a water resistant strap or wear it with more casual attire. You get hand engraving and guilloche. You can see that the ratchet and the crown wheel covers are integrated and fully engraved just like you'll find on vintage English pocket watches. If we can go back to the Garrick S4 dial you can see just how much customization is available on the dial side. Numerals as you like them, hands, colors, guilloche, all of it the real thing too. This is a watch you're going to pay uh, between eight and nine thousand dollars to own and that's with custom options and unlike a lot of high horology brands that sell you on craftsmanship they sell you on that too, but they assure accuracy of three seconds a day. And that's something few brands at any price point are willing to do. These are fantastic watches. And again, you're guaranteed to speak with the people who own and run Garrick when you buy these watches. Highly recommended. Second honorable mention, Tag Heuer and the rarely seen 1000 piece Carrera MP412C. Now I never saw any evidence that they actually built out the full series of 1000, but that was the initial claim when they teased this watch in 2011. It it didn't hit the market until 2014 for reasons that are not clear, but it may have had something to do with the initial plan to distribute these exclusively through McLaren dealers rather than conventional watch ADs. It is modeled after the McLaren road car of the same name, and there is the instrument panel so you can see where the design of the watch came from. It has an engaging dial that is an annual calendar with flyback chronograph atop the same module from Dubois de Praz that's used on an RM11. And you can see they even finished the dial side of it to make it more attractive through the smoked sapphire center of the dial. And note that the center of the dial, if we go back to the previous picture of the McLaren, the center of the dial looks like the instrument binnacle of the McLaren. And that is absolutely intentional. Uh, this watch is 43 millimeters in titanium with a nice media blasted profile, those classic angular integrated Carrera lugs, so it looks the part of Tag Heuer's design icon. And with all that functionality, plus automatic winding, plus plenty of loom, plus 100 meters of water resistance, this is no mean motor, motorsports chrono. This is a 43 millimeter tie watch that wears pretty well on a small wrist, and you can wear it with any attire. A very special piece, even if you're not a gearhead, even if you're not a McLaren guy, heck, even if you own a Ferrari or a Lambo, I won't tell and I won't judge. This is one of the ultimate motorsports watches and a great bet to purchase for between seven and $9,000 used. This thing retailed for 14 grand when it was new, so it is a buy today. Viewer question, Tim, who is your favorite James Bond? 
Before I explain that, let me see what's going on in the box. We've got just in EDC, his everyday carry. I actually like the new Baltic with micro rotor and offset small seconds. That would be the new salmon dial model, I believe. We have Abdul in the box, Dr. Zachary Smith. Can you still get discounts on Omega? It depends on the model and it depends on the dealer. Dealer in the middle of nowhere, probably. DeVille, probably. Some Seamaster and Speedmaster models, definitely not. Though some are still available. I don't think anyone's going to hold you up for list price on a Ploprof, for example. What else is going on? We've got David Ponciano. Sup, Tim. First live chat. David, thank you for joining me. I appreciate that. We have Philip Lynn. Are the hands on the 3861 Speedy bent? From my memory, they're not. But that, that's my recollection, that, that the minute and seconds hands, the chrono seconds and the minute hands are not bent. Again, that's just my recollection, but I don't think they are. And then we have Anthony N asking, Tim, when is Omega releasing an annual calendar chronograph? I would say given Omega's tendency to add modules on top of already thick base movements, Omega will release an annual calendar chronograph when they find a way to make it less than one inch thick. That's my guess. All right, back to the question du jour, the question of the moment. Who is your favorite James Bond? My favorite James Bond is, controversially, I'm sure, Roger Moore, a classically trained actor. He was not a remanufactured bodybuilder and Navy man like Sean Connery. He came to the role with a critical perspective that no Bond before or since has ever brought to the challenge of playing Agent 007. Moore had a sound reasoning, saying, Look, this guy is supposed to be a secret agent in clandestine service, and yet everywhere he goes, people already know his name before he tells them. That's inherently absurd. This isn't a spy role. This is a parody of a spy role. And he brought that perspective to playing James Bond longer than anyone and doing it with a striking sense of humor that worked. He was suave when he needed to be. He inhabited the role with a real persona. And he pulled off sometimes goofy gags in a way that you were willing to forgive because he was Roger Moore and he did it well. He didn't get the best scripts. A lot of the Bond movies he was in were objectively not that well written. Daniel Craig, Sean Connery, maybe even a little bit Pierce Brosnan early on got better scripts than Roger Moore did. It was his ability to approach the character like no other Bond who made him tr and th that made him truly memorable and in my estimation the best pure actor ever to play the role and my favorite Bond more for sentimental reasons than anything else. But that's my answer. No, he's not a brutal killer like Connery or Daniel Craig. But then again, I don't care. <laughs> it is an absurd role. What's your name? Bond. Oh yeah, James Bond. I know you. In Bangkok? Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you. That's not a secret agent. All right. Let's see what's going on on your wrist on my list. Viewers chats number three, starting with George B. Rolls in his Lotus. Very nice. With his Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Apollo 8. Possibly the best version of the dark side. Scott R. and his Rolex Sea Dweller roll in the Chevy Equinox. Looking good. Nice cuff, too. I love the partial cuff. That's a well-staged wrist shot. JCS impresses with his rare Japanese domestic market Rolex Turnograph Limited Edition. Alex R. By the way, that is an awesome piece. 300 pieces, black dial, two-tone, green accents. That Rolex Limited Edition JDM is one most people, including most Rolex dealers, don't know exists. But now we're talking about Alex R. Virginia taking the wheel with his IWC Mark 12, a wonderful 90s era JLC powered IWC on a rare full beaded bracelet. Very cool stuff. I'd love to know what car that is. Robin T is in Northumbria, UK with a modern day take on the VW Pop Top Camper, ironically named the California for the UK market, and the Zin U50 Diver looking good in a size that we can all relate to. We've got Dr. Giannis P charging up with some caffeine and his Rolex Datejust Looking good, guys. Thanks so much. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Viewer question, Tim. Manual transmission or automatic? Manual transmission. 
if you want the full involvement, if you want to be part of the process as opposed to a passenger, I always feel like the manual transmission is the answer. Now, if you just want a commuter or you want a pure luxury car, I can see times when the manual might not be at the top of your agenda. If you need something that's a big S-Class type car to cruise and stop and go traffic, if you're in the Mercedes EQS electric full luxury car, okay, fine, fine. Inching along in LA traffic in that thing or a Tesla Model S, I can see how maybe you don't need a manual transmission there. But if this is a matter of preference in an enthusiast car, I don't care if it's a full-size D-Class machine. I wish I could have gotten my old Audi S8 with the manual transmission that they offered on that car in the European and UK markets. It's so much more of a process. You are, you are part of the car with a manual transmission. Blipping, shifting, matching revs, all of it, so cool. I can get in a car with a stick shift and drive around for an hour or two on my favorite driving roads and never once miss the radio or wonder about what my phone's doing. To me, that is the epitome of the driving experience. And a manual transmission can make driving a slow car fast a lot of fun. And as an example, I cite every Mazda Miata ever made. The manual transmission adds a dimension. And these days, it looks like the market agrees. Check out the price delta between something like a Ferrari 599 with and without the manual box. Or take a look at the Aston Vanquish first generation work service conversions compared to the auto manual version. History will remember the six speeds well. Okay. Now, let's go into the best $20,000 to $40,000 watch. And I got two here, and they're very different. First, we're going to start at the lower end of the range with the Breguet Marine 5817. 39 millimeters, stainless steel, a solid gold dial cut on a real vintage rose lathe, and then galvanized either silver, white, black, or blue. I like the blue and the silver, but the black and the silver is probably the most broadly pleasing version. If you want to tailor it as more of a dress watch, you can get the silver version version. You've got options, and that's a great thing. The case is hand-finished, which is exceptional. The movement is handmade and hand-finished, which likewise adds a lot of interest. So you wind up with a case style and movement that are extensively artisanal. All of this is loomed, automatic, stainless steel, and 100 meters water resistant, meaning this 2005 to, it's 2005, 2004 when this one came out, but it was definitely finished in 2018 when the next generation Marine came out. This one still features a lot of the design elements that Jorg Heisek penned on the original Marine of the early 1990s. And for me, with the 39 millimeter case size, it's just about perfect. This is an opulent dress watch that can be your sports watch and vice versa. Throw it on the bracelet, it's more formal. Throw it on a rubber strap, it's super sporty. Throw it on leather and now you can wear it black tie. This watch does it all. It comes from a great brand that will always be around to service it. And the market is 10 to $15,000. Closer to 10 if you want to get it on a strap, $15,000 if you want to get it on a bracelet. You can see there are options like black dial, blue dial bracelet to give it a little bit more of a range if you want something that feels like a solid like-for-like -like Royal Oak or Nautilus alternative for a fraction of the money. This is a great way to spend 15 grand on a sports slash dress watch. Now, let's say you have a bit more money to spend. You're looking for a dress watch. Well, we're going to go up the price spectrum to about $46,000 dollars now and I realize that's over the top but I'll explain in a moment. First, let's talk about the Laurent Ferrier Galet Micro Rotor. Several different versions. This is the Galet Square Boreal with the fully loomed dial and stainless steel. That's how you get your Galet Micro Rotor if you want a sportier take and you don't want to pay for precious metal. It's going to be 41 millimeters as the Galet Square, 40 millimeters as the round case. Go with the Boreal. I think it's the coolest version or you can go with salmon dials. Many options exist within the Galley uh, range. Steel is the one to go for, but there are two different shapes, the Galley round and the Galley square with several different dials. It is a $46,000 new watch, but you're going to find it under $40,000 used, and you will find quite a few options at that price point, including several different dials, including my personal favorite, Boreal. Now, the caliber is a rare beauty. If you want something that falls just, and I mean only just, short of Grubel Forsy, Fernand Bertou, or perhaps Romain Gautier. And it's almost a dead heat, but Laurent Ferrier, so good. They make the 150, 170 watches a year, and they don't construct pieces. They finish and they regulate in-house. And the quality of the finishing you get 
is worth the price of admission, whether you buy them new or used. Just remember, for under 42 grand, I don't think you can find a better finished watch. For under 40 grand, you're gonna be paying 36, 38, 39. Get your hands on this. It's got a natural escapement, double direct impulse, three day power reserve, micro rotor automatic, bevels so wide and bright you will have to wear shades while looking through your loop. A very special watch. They don't shy away from black polish. They don't shy away from interior angles. You get one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven interior angles, depending on how you count them on that movement. Many Geneva Hallmark movements give you zero. Very cool stuff. Viewer question, Tim, beer or wine? Before I answer that, let me jump into the box and see what you guys are saying right here. Okay. Enrique C. saying, was about to say 205 GTI, one of the most fun cars ever. And then we have Mr. Paradigm 1981 saying, Federico loves his. Federico loves his what? His, his, what did he have? The Ferrari California, was it? Or does he have another car now? We have Foy Gras saying S8, maintenance nightmare, times two in my case. I was dumb enough to buy twice. That's a disease. I've had three Audis. <laughs> we have right here, Milli Vanilli, Ferrari 12 cylinder or Porsche six cylinders. I can tell you from having heard them undilute straight from the headers to the exhaust pipe at a racetrack that a Porsche flat six is this horrible ear bleeding atonal thrash, whereas a Ferrari V12 will bring tears to your eyes. So emphatically Ferrari V12. What else is going on? We have Jim Millett saying you can't heel and toe and rev match in an auto. That's true. Some of them now will do it for you, but that's not as much fun. Mark S. asking, Tim had an S8. I had two 2003 D2 generation S8s, both of them in brilliant black with caramel interior and Vavona wood trim. They were wonderful cars, but cleaning up the previous owner's deferred maintenance, I spent enough money to buy like a chronomet blue at list price. It was stupid. I should have just gone out and bought myself like a 993 or a Corvette Z06. Now, I know I just said I don't like the sound of a Porsche flat six. I like the way they drive. What else is going on right here? We have Edward Ledden of Sweden saying, I was taught to drive in a manual 1985 Volvo 740. Angie asking, Tim, what is your all-time favorite chronograph? It's probably going to be the Amvox 2, the original titanium 44mm JLC Amvox 2. Awesome automotive themes without being slavishly co-branded. It was probably the best watches and wheels co-branding of all time. Plus, it was a distinct model that had no equivalent elsewhere in the JLC model lineup. Pusherless, you press the crystal top and bottom to start, stop, and reset. The only rivalry would be another JLC, the white gold Duomet chronograph. I owned both of these for four years and I loved them both. All right, jumping back, what is going on? Oh my gosh, guys, you're asking me beer or wine and I'm gonna answer bourbon. It's bourbon, guys, I'm sorry, you, you gotta know me better by this point. It's not beer, it's not wine, it's bourbon. And for me, it's gonna be Knob Creek. It's gonna be Knob Creek Rye, Knob Creek Single Barrel, or perhaps standard Knob Creek, which is pretty high test stuff and still has a very dry rye taste to it. There's a lot of rye even in standard Knob Creek. It's got a good burn to it. It's the kind of thing you can take once neat and really appreciate the complexity of the flavor without sinking two or three of them and just getting flat out drunk which I did at an FP Journe dinner one time. What else is going on? Viewer question, red or white wine? Okay, well, since I have to choose some kind of wine here, for me, it's gonna be red. They say white wine is an acquired taste. I never acquired that taste. Sure, champagne is great for a winner of a race, a Grand Prix, or a wedding toast, but if I'm actually gonna drink it, and I've got my preference, it's gonna be red. And I know they say you can't eat, you know, fish, you can't eat chicken, you can't eat light poultry, and drink red wine. I ask why the hell not? And if I can't drink red wine with my fish, then I'm gonna kindly ask that you give me non-dolphin safe tuna. So at the very least, I can have some red meat aquatic food with my red wine. All right, let's jump back into viewer wrist shots number four. Julian M treats us to a rare sighting of the AP Huitième Perpetuel. It's a perpetual calendar from the early 90s and late 1980s in chronograph form. Awesome stuff. Dylan L and his tutor Pelagos a brand new acquisition that he showcased on our Facebook group, Talking Time with Tim Masso, boasts one of the best loom shots in the dive watch segment. Jason M of Cleveland strikes a classical wrist pose with his Panerai Luminor PAM422 looking good. We have Tamim A showcasing his 
Rolex Milgauss GVZ Blue from Bahrain. He is a man who agrees with me that this is probably the ultimate Rolex. And then we have Chris M in his Toyota Land Cruiser cruising the land with his Panerai Luminor Marina looking like the 1950 Case 2 guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, best $50,000 to $100,000 watches. This is where the fun really starts because you can buy almost anything. You can get a grand complication for this kind of money. But I've also sung the praises of the IWC Grand Complication 3770 on the show before, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Instead, I recommend the obvious choice. For under 100 grand, buy it used the Alango Unzona datagraph, the 403035, the original wonder of 1999, 39 millimeters in platinum and born perfect. Do you wish to own the most important chronograph of the last 40 years? 1999, year one for the watch that forced Patek and Switzerland generally to reform. Fewer customer calibers and a higher standard of finish necessary after this 39mm platinum revolution. The dial is black galvanized but sterling silver, which is why as these watches age, the sub-registers for the chronograph in constant seconds will begin to darken as this one you see here. It has a movement, caliber L951 that remains a gold standard for finish and functions. Look at it, the colors, the quality, the detail, the depth, everything about it is surpassing. It's a flyback standard. It's handmade in every regard. The same standard of finish that you find on the German silver bridges is rendered on the much harder and harder to finish steel chronograph components. And Philippe Dufour mentioned this watch unprompted when we met. I started asking him what other watches interest you from beyond your brand. And he's famous for wearing the rose gold black dial 39, but he had to bring it up again, emphasizing how impressed he was by Longa. He said he was compelled to buy the watch. That is the ultimate seal of approval. Prices have firmed up since 2019 when I interviewed Dufour, but the Dato remains good value given its legacy, and especially compared to something like a Platinum Patek Philippe 5070, this is still a watch that's underpriced relative to what it is and what you get. Now, Vacheron Constantin overseas, third generation, but not the usual self-winding. No, we're talking about the ultra thin, offered briefly and then only through Vacheron boutiques. This is the rarest third generation overseas, aside from special edition versions of the mainstream models. This was made as a unique model with a unique case and a unique movement and bracelet fewer than 100 pieces, and again, only through boutiques. The closest thing that has ever existed to a Vacheron Constantin 5711 or AP Jumbo, the core model, the heart and soul of the model line, the closest Vacheron ever came to reissuing the 222, and the caliber 1120 inside this watch is the same movement from the 1977 Vacheron 222. Heck, it's the same movement from the 1972 Royal Oak 5402 and the 1976 Nautilus Jumbo 3700. This is an important movement, one of the few times you will find it in the modern Vacheron. Plus, this watch with an exclusive no-date dial is extraordinary. 40 millimeters in diameter by only 7.5 millimeters thick and true to the claim, I've measured it, it lives up. You get extra straps, one in leather, one in rubber, quick release lugs so you can swap them without tools, a micro sizing bracelet that has two micro adjusts built in, and it's a screw down crown with a 50 meter water resistance rating, so it is light duty swimmable. It has a razor like case profile, as you can see of this example that I reviewed. I mean, so narrow, it looks like it must be six, maybe even five millimeters thick. $56,500 when new, and it sold poorly. It launched into a terrible market for watches from 2015 to early 2017. Plus, the Generation 3 overseas was pretty much dead on arrival. Too expensive, it was priced out of the reach of the people who had previously bought overseas, and the people who could afford Nautiluses and Royal Oaks just kept buying those. So this was a challenged model in a challenged generation. I'm guessing that if one of these were to hit the market, and we haven't sold one recently, it would be somewhere between $80,000 and $100,000. If you find one and the owner is willing to sell and you've got the money, do not hesitate. This may become the most collectible Vacheron Constantin sports watch of the 21st century. Extremely desirable, extremely rare. This is a Vacheron that needs no excuses. It is a Patek, AP, and Longa equal or superior. Jumping into the box, let's see what you guys are saying in the box. 
Okay, Jim Millet, that VC is the star of the show for me. Millie Vanilli, love the no date VC overseas, just not a fan of the dial tone. It's sort of a beige gray. I can see it being a little bit controversial. If you look closely, it's got some blue accents. I think you need to see it in person. It warms up in the flesh. Right here we have Enrique C saying, I've never seen one of these for sale. I've seen one. I reviewed it and thank goodness I did because we haven't had one since and it has now been years. Thomas Burnett saying, amazing, harks back to the legendary 222. And then we've got, Enjoy47 commenting that it is white gold. That's true. It is a white gold watch. I suspect if a steel version of this were ever made, it would break the internet and possibly give Vacheron a way to force you to buy a bunch of yellow or rose gold dress watches in the process. And then we have Tim Wright saying, I would not mind getting one of these overseas at retail. Hey, if you can find one still available, you're the man. Okay, let's see what else. We have someone saying, greetings from Croatia. That's Pete's time, Peace Safari. Staying up late with me in the Balkans. Thank you so much. And then we've got Dave P saying, cool t-shirt clock plus green sport coat. Ariel Adams sells these periodically. He sent this one to me for free. It actually glows in the dark, but you can sometimes find it on the A Blog to Watch store. This, this is just my new style. And of course, this is my old style. I've got some new glasses coming too. All right, let's see what's going on right here. Patek Philippe 5961A. 2014 to 2018, we are talking about the white dial model. Quick, name a few Patek Philippe steel sports watches that aren't a Nautilus, an Aquanaut, or a 24. Hard to do. But you know, steel Patek sports watches are the money shot when it comes to investments. And this is a rare one. 40.5 millimeters in stainless steel. This is a charmer that's a multi-complication built for parts of five model years. You get it all. Integrated steel bracelet, flyback chronograph, power reserve indicator, annual calendar with aperture display, automatic winding, day date indicator, or I should say day night indicator, column wheel, vertical clutch, anti-magnetic hairspring, and tons and tons of loom. This is a bold 5960 that's not any bigger than the standard 5960. Look at prices for the boring silver dial Nautilus. And then think about the relative value of the steel 5960. This is a full bracelet steel Patek Philippe sports watch multi-complication that was rarely sold when new. And at least right now, real inventory is still available from dealers at attractive prices starting in the 60s from first world dealers. This is a watch, yes, there's also a super collectible black dial, and I want to acknowledge that, but that is minimally a $100,000 investment. With the white dial, this is a watch you can buy now and own and wear and enjoy, and you will get all your money back in the future, because this is a watch that's going places. The fact that you can now buy it in the 60s and the 70s just speaks to the deficit of attention amongst people with money buying Pateks online right now, because this thing is scarcer than any 5711 in steel. All right, viewer question, Marvel or DC? Again, another unpopular answer, I prefer DC. Part of this might be because of smaller characters that I like, like Booster Gold or Starman. Starman during the 90s was very cool, and I didn't really like the violent anti-heroes of that period, so there was something reassuring about the likes of Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, who all had codes of ethics and sort of old-school senses of honors. As a kid growing up in the 1990s, you know, the most traditional superheroes to me turned out to be the most appealing. And I was deeply impressed by the death of Superman storyline in the early 90s. I think everyone remembers that. That was a huge deal for an impressionable kid getting into comics. And I'm a little bit of an artist myself, and I always liked the art in a lot of those books. So no, they're not as emotionally complex and tortured and conflicted as Marvel heroes. Even the rewrites of Bruce Wayne in the modern era that have made him a little bit more complex and dark don't quite quite flip the script. Marvel is still where you go to find heroes who have all sorts of identity crisis. DC is where you go to get old school superheroes, golden age type superheroes for the modern age. All right, jumping into the box. Hans N, when will Hollywood make good movies again rather than another comic film? Here's the thing, like, I'm not calling you a retro grouch, but when will Hollywood make good movies again has been on the lips of every fan slash critic since Hollywood started making movies. That's an old refrain. Look carefully, you can always find good movies. That said, if you don't like superhero and comic movies, this is a bad time for you. The question is, when will DC start making consistently good superhero movies? Because they have a very mixed track record of it. All right, jumping back to the script, 
Without flipping the script, we're talking about the best one hundred to three hundred thousand dollar watch. This now is where you could spend almost anything you want to get anything you want, and I really had to pare down because. You could get Grubel 4C for this price point. You could buy a new Fernandber 2 FB1. Almost everything is on the table, but I think the Debetune Dreamwatch 5 is where I would start to spend it. A watch that debuted at about 160,000 Swiss francs back in 2014 now costs between 180 and 200,000. Back in 2014, the Dreamwatch 5 dropped, and what's surprising here is that it's not the rigidly mechanical or outrageously avant-garde look of most Debitune timepieces. This one is somewhere between organic and, and one might even say a bit of a retro spacecraft sensibility. And I'm talking early 1950s War of the Worlds. This looks like no other Debitune timepiece. Some people have compared it to a seashell. And yeah, from an organic perspective, I do see that. This thing is not just a dream watch in name. It is a dream watch in fact. Debitune designed the Dream Watch 5 as a moon phase and jump hour with a five day power reserve and cases in every material from titanium as you see here to raw finished meteorite. And for Metallica fans, there is a blackened version. That is hot and almost impossible to see, but you get your choices. You can also get it in rose gold, you can also get it engraved. For the few that they make, there are many different options to the point that they almost come out of the factory as piece unique. You will get the watch you want. And again, these are basically built on request. So you are going to wind up with something that is highly individual. One hundred and eighty to two hundred thousand dollars, but be able to spend up to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you want to get it in meteorite with a thirty second, thirty six thousand vibration per hour tourbillon. Okay, Patek Philippe. We've talked about sports watches and we've talked about steel, but we're dumping both of those right now for a watch that's halfway between a dress watch and a sports watch and made out of platinum. Launched in 2019, this is the Patek Philippe Calatrava Pilot Alarm Travel Time. It is all of those things and it's got more appurtenances off its side than a potato with eyes or a warthog. But don't judge immediately, there's more to see. Nobody talks about this watch. It launched and it vanished. It has exquisite dial details, including a combination of granular frosting, azurage, and a sunburst with a deep luminous grain. Uh, it has an on-off indicator for the alarm, two day-night indicators for the separate time zones, and a digital display of the time, which can be set to five, five or 15 minute increments. Uh, you have hours and you have minutes and you can set them digitally. This is an awesome watch with tons of loom for sports watch aficionados. And so this is a true high horology sports watch. It has eye watering movement finish though. And you can see it uses a black polished minute repeater striker, a conventional circular gong and a centrifugal governor, just as you would find in a minute repeater. It sounds like one too. We have this eye-watering movement finish and the mind-blowing intricacy of the assembly. It is beautifully finished on both sides, including the side that you cannot see. And there, I correct myself, it is 15 minute setting increments for the minutes. And you have the option to set broadly across the full 24 hour spectrum with the hours. This is a very cool watch. It's the best of everything. And if you've ever noticed, high-end alarm watches generally disappear from public view. They're hugely underrated because a lot of folks think that alarm watches watches are low end to mid range complications. So we have wonderful singing musical minute repeater style alarm watches from the likes of Patek Philippe, Harry Winston Breguet, and I can think of even a couple of other as Chronode makes a minute repeater like alarm movement that's in the Harry Winston, but it sells it to a lot of other brands. So. I think if you've got the money, give this thing a chance. At 260222 US dollars, uh, that's a lot of money, but then again, you're getting a lot. Can you think of a more broadly capable travel watch? I can't. I wouldn't rather travel with anything else. This thing's got your two time zones and your alarm to wake you up for that red eye flight. It's got the AM PM for both home and local time zones. Most travel time watches don't have that. And it's got enough loom that you can view it in the diminished light of an aircraft cabin on an overseas overnight flight. Plus you can hide the second time zone hand when you don't need it on the dial. The best of everything. And again, 260,220 US dollars.
for a minute repeater like alarm worth the price to me. Send me your wrist shots, Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. I wanna thank Sean, who as ever is the man who makes the pictures happen and cleans up my technical mess on the back end. And thanks to you out in the chat box for making the world's best job possible. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.